if you confuse people, both patients and your team, too much, it's not going to become a solid part of your practice. Specialists exist to do special things. With the advancements in clear liner therapy and short-term orthos straight wire systems, treating a class one malocclusion is no longer a special thing, in my opinion. It should be in the toolbox of any well-versed general practice. I achieve ridiculous stuff with Invisalign and malocclusions that you would you always hear, oh, they need comprehensive braces like the, with that. Honestly, I can achieve a great result with any malocclusion using Invisalign because I know how teeth work and I know the mechanics that need to happen. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast Gygenist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienist, episode number 316. My name is Andrew. Hey, everyone, I want to apologize. My voice sounds terrible. I know this is probably really hurting your ears just, just listening to this. This past weekend, we were at the Voices of Dentistry Conference. It was so much fun. If you haven't been, make sure you guys check it out next year. We did so much podcasting, though. Uh, we did some podcasting for this show. We did some podcasting on other people's show. Uh, so much, in fact, that I lost my voice just a little bit. So sorry about that. Uh, but in fact, you know, this is where this week's interview comes from, is from the voice of dentistry. You might hear a little bit of background noise as we were sitting in the conference hall recording with Dr. Matt Standridge, and we talked about orthodontics. And I feel like as a hygienist, there's a lot to learn about orthodontics. It's not that that basic thing that we learn in school. So some of the things that we talked about, uh, you know, our job as clinicians, as we're assessing patients, what does that look like? There was a classification system that he talked about that I'd never heard of before. I'm used to the the classifications that are on our little clipboards, right? Like our little cheat sheet clipboards that have like the alignment of the teeth. But he let us know about this, this different classification, but also, you know, the problems with the classification systems, which are things I never even thought of before. So I think one of the biggest things that I'm uh, really excited for him to talk to you guys about and for you guys to hear is his thoughts on whether or not to use clear liner therapy for really extreme cases. Because I remember when I was in school and I mentioned this on the episode is, you know, you don't do, it's for cosmetic. That's what clear liner therapy is all about. And granted, that was more than 10 years ago, but still like, you know, I I remember that being continually kind of the thought process for hygiene is, hey, we don't, we don't do really extreme cases with clear liner therapy. And so I, I mean, I'm very excited for you to listen to what he has to say about that. And so I'm really sure that you're going to, going to love his interview. I was joined on this episode, though, by the Latina RDH, Amber Lovatos. She was also at the conference and I really appreciate her being on if you haven't heard, she also has a podcast called Un Cuento de Dos Higienistas, which is essentially a tale of two hygienists, but in Spanish. She hosts it with her sister, and she has some really great guests on. So if you're bilingual or you have a Spanish-speaking dental professional in your office, please make sure you let them know so they can search it out. As a tip for searching it out, if you can't remember uh, Un Cuento de Dos Higienistas, it's written in the show notes. So make sure you click on that. But you can also just search out a tale of two hygienists, usually in uh, the podcast apps, and it'll be under one of the ones that we that we host as well. Um, so speaking of which, if you could all do me a favor, please hit a subscribe button for us for this show. We want to be in the top search for all the podcasts when people are looking for dental hygiene podcasts, and that would really help us a lot. And while you're hitting that button, please make sure that you rate and review us. Make sure you tell a friend. We did get a new review come through. I'll read it on next week's episode. Speaking of next week, we have another great show planned. It was a roundtable recording that focused on local anesthesia and the questions that everyone's always asking, you know, you know those dental groups, those forums that are online. Uh, so don't miss out on the answers that Tina and Kelly were sharing with us. And one more thing, we have a huge, huge, huge announcement coming out soon. And I really hate when people say that. And I apologize for that. I promise you, I am not leading you up to a huge letdown. But we have some ginormous news. And so please don't miss the next couple of episodes as we, we let you guys in on some of the things that are happening. So, okay, that's it for me. Enjoy this interview with Dr. Matt Standridge. 
Um, so we've already started the podcast, by the way. This oh, is okay, Dr. We're Matt, cool. Matt All right. Standridge. Thanks for letting us know. Yep. <laughs> no problem. Um, and so, let, well, let's talk, doctor. So first of all, if you don't mind just giving like a little background of who you are and what you do for our listeners. Yeah. Um, who's your daddy? What does he do? Um, so <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, I graduated from UMKC in 2010. So I've been doing this for a little over a decade and I've owned my own practice since 2012. And so, yeah, and I practice in very kind of poor rural county area of Kansas. Mm-hmm. So there's no specialists around me. I'm kind of a one man band in our county and all that stuff. So we do a little bit of everything, anything mm-hmm. and everything, mm-hmm. trying to keep people healthy and keep them out of pain. And um, yeah, just have a little four op office. I run out two rooms. I have two full-time hygienists, and I do everything under the sun from endo to oral surgery to reconstructive type stuff. And like you kind of alluded to earlier, my real passion is ortho. It's about 30% of my clinical practice, nice. of my time, Yeah. Um, not including hygiene or anything, but of my time, um, it's about 30% ortho. And yeah, that's what we do. But you, and you also educate other people. You teach other mm-hmm. people. What do you do there? Yeah, so I cut my teeth um, uh, as far as teaching about five years ago in orthodontics. Mm-hmm. And I was teaching for Garrity Orthodontic Seminars, which is a comprehensive straight wire group based out of Tulsa at the time. Now they're down in Dallas. And that's where I started at um, teaching wise. And since then, I've kind of grown out to start my own thing. I was teaching for Blue Sky Bio, and I still teach for them for kind of in-house clear aligner type stuff. Mm -hmm. And then last year, I joined up with Tarun Agarwal with 3D Dennis. T-Bone. Yep. So I. Yep, shout out to T-Bone, and I am the leader of their orthodontic arm of the 3D Dentist curriculum now. And then also starting some stuff with GC Ortho with their headquarters outside of Chicago. Fantastic. So, and as much as I love clinical dentistry, I have just as much satisfaction, if not more so, teaching other providers because... Out of an idea of the whole, oh, type of abundance and expansion Mm. type of mindset, you know, there's only so many lives that I can improve inside the walls of my practice. That's the buzzword, abundance mindset. Right, yeah, Yeah. abundance mindset, all that stuff. Yeah, eradicating scarcity, you know, (laughs) all that (laughs) stuff, right? All of these influencer type terms. But that is true, like, you know, as much as I love transforming lives in my office, I know that the more lives that I transform provider wise that then have a trickle down effect yeah. to bringing that to their offices. It just, I don't know. There's a big sense of satisfaction out of that. I, I feel like a lot of us are on that same, at least a lot of Any us here. Any podcaster has to have that a we little bit. We feel that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, sure. that's why you do this. You know, that's yeah. why you put in the hours outside of your normal nine to five. Well, to I do think stuff it's also like a this. little bit of selfishness. If I'm being honest about it, it's like, you know, you and I never would have met if, right. this, if we didn't have a podcast. Right. I would never get to have you sit in front of me and learn from you. you know, mm-hmm. like, learn from all the experts in the field. Right. Like a, like a front row seat, right? So right. it's a little bit of selfishness. Andrew secretly wants to be famous. I don't want to be famous. I just want to learn all of from the famous people. Right. So. There's that too. So you kind of learned, um, I, I guess not learned, but you really jumped into all of the subspecialties because of necessity. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what are you going to do? Refer to, out to who? Yeah, and you know. and it's, that's especially with orthodontics because, like, I don't know, like, with the oral surgeons, if I send out to them and they're an hour drive away for, like, wisdom teeth, well, that's one appointment, sure. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Versus orthodontics, which is an hour appointment every three weeks for two years, like, that's a lot harder sell. That's mm-hmm. a barrier. Yeah, yeah, it is a yeah. barrier. Starting off, I learned from Rick DePaul with his power pox six months miles type stuff and that's where i started at but it opened my eyes to orthodontics and so i would be referring kids and teenagers and stuff to the orthodontist and i would see these kids six months or a year later and nothing's changes they're not in orthodontics nothing's happening and i'd ask mom or dad like well what's what what's going on here and they're like well 
you know, I'd have we'd have to go back every three weeks for two years. I just can't take that much time off right. work. They can't miss that much time off of school and all that stuff. And it's a two-hour round trip yeah. to do this. Yeah. And it's just like, so th- out of necessity, because being some sort of a capitalist, I look at the the need of the area and is it being fulfilled or not? Yeah. And if not, then it's like, well, what could I do to help fulfill that need? And so that's where it really originated yeah. from. And then... That was about nine years ago, and it's just kind of grown from there. So I have your your presentation was awesome this morning. I um, appreciate I, that. that. Yeah, it's it's always. So good. I'm going I'm going to be fully transparent here and a little vulnerable. Um, it's always a little bit nerve wracking when you do a presentation for the first time. Like what I did this morning. That's the first presentation of this kind of simplified. Really way of looking at diagnosis like that's the first version of that i've ever done here so it's like in a way it was good because i love this meeting and it's basically like i'm speaking with friends sure but at the same time anytime i'm doing like a presentation that is stock new Mm. like there's still a little bit of that pucker factor going on like and just like yeah how's this going to go you know type does it make it worse when you say when you say hey everyone who has done ortho in your office raise your hand and most of the room has raised their hand right does that make you a little more nervous (laughs) yeah it's like (laughs) well a little bit but at the same time i've run around in the ortho circles enough that i knew that still a decent amount of what i was teaching unless if they really went down a deep dive rabbit hole yeah. of ortho education is still going to be new to them yeah like i don't care how well versed you think you are in invisalign or sure smile or six month smiles or mm-hmm. whatever mm-hmm. unless if you actually read this stuff yourself you yeah. probably don't know it yeah and so that so i had a little bit of comfort with that but like i said running through anything new for the first time is still a little bit of a well it came off of as a very polished so i appreciate I, that I, i'm Thank also you. a novice for all of this stuff so you could have fooled me no matter what <laughs> so um so what i'd like to do if it's okay with you i have you know a sheet here lots of different questions about lots of different things it's going to be jumping around it's not going to be nearly and for the audience listening look this isn't going to be a comprehensive discussion on everything you need to know as a hygienist for ortho, as a team member for ortho, or even a doctor if you're listening. It's not going to be comprehensive in that way. But I want to put nuggets in your head of of things to think about because um, one of the things we're going to tackle in in like a minute is um, the standard classifications that we were taught, class one, class two, and then what you were saying Uh was completely different. I'm like, what is this? Yeah, so that's the thing is like, well, so talk to me a little bit from the hygienist standpoint, because I may only talk with doctors. Sure. Talk with me a little bit about from a hygienist standpoint, as far as what your guys' teaching and understanding is of malocclusion in class one, class two, class three, all that stuff. Very, very basic. And then you, you fix me if I'm also saying things wrong, but it was very much, okay, so we know where class one is. So we do canine and molar relationships, all we do. Mm-hmm. And this isn't even necessary standard in all practices, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of practices, like, okay, doc, doctors got it. We're going to just do this. So, so we, you know, if we do it, we do it. If we don't, we don't. Okay. We look at um, crowding. We look at, um, but we don't really, there's no classifications for crowding. Either they have it, mild, moderate, severe. Okay. You know, you look at overbite, um, now, overjet. Uh, let, let, let me pause you for a second on that mild, moderate, severe. Do you have an objective way of looking? There's at- no millimeters. There's no, okay. yeah. Okay. So okay. And it depends on your software, obviously, yeah. too. Um, and it depends on, like, your practice. But, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, like, it's so basic. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be super honest. Like, yeah, in hygiene school, I w- went to a dental school that was in a hygiene hi- program in a dental school. Right. Right. So we took um, anatomy with the dental students. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we learned occlusion. And in hygiene school, like, we did measurements and whatever. I haven't done that since I graduated eight years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's that's, like, that's the truth. It's one, two, three. Like, that, that's all we know. But then, yeah. like, when you were talking earlier and you're like, hold on, a, a class one's not really a class one, especially if it's rotating in a certain way. And I'm like, wait. And then you had, there's qualifiers that we need to know. Uh huh. Can you go over some of those, some of these things? Yeah. So, you know, if you, you know, quiz dentists, line them up nine times out of 10, their definition of a class one occlusion is going to be 
the mesial buccal cusp of the for first molar is in the central groove of the lower first molar, right? Like, and is that what you guys basically, yeah, basically. learned? Yep. Like, I'm if have you took check your hygiene occlusion. boards, <laughs> what's that? I'm going to have y'all check my occlusion because I don't have maxillary canines or mandibular first molars. Yeah. So we can okay, <laughs> yeah, smile here. So no. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so, like, if you ask most people in the dental world what a class one occlusion is, that would be their rote memory mm-hmm. textbook answer, yep. right? But as I talked about in my presentation, if you do a deeper dive of that, that's that's pretty misleading. To me, there's a lot better of key indicators to really detect what is a class one occlusion because there are rotations that happen with that molar And I showed those pictures Mm -hmm. of that and a scan of when I was doing a workup and I was like, see, that's perfect. When I was doing my analysis and that mesial buccal cusp is in that central groove, but it is not a class one. And because that molar was so distally rotated, so that mesial buccal cusp is in that central groove, but that's because of the rotation that's happening in that molar. Mm -hmm. And it happens to me all the time. It happens to my students. And it happened to me when I first started with orthodontics. And I was starting with straight wire. Mm. So you bracket or band these molars. You run straight wires and it derotates that Mm. molar that I had labeled class one. Now, all of a sudden, as it derotates, all of a sudden that molar is class two, and I'm crapping myself like, what did I do wrong? Because yeah. I start, I marked this thing as a class one case, and now all of a sudden it's class two, and I messed up. It's like, well, no, mechanically I didn't mess up. Diagnostically, I messed up because a true class one case, this molar, it's not only that that mesial buccal cusp is in that central groove, Mm -hmm. but there's also no rotations in that molar. Yeah. In a derotated molar, in a straight line molar, not only is that mesial buccal cusp in that central groove, but that distal buccal cusp is also hitting that mesial ridge of the second molar, meaning there's no rotation going on. And then also the premolar in front of it is in that embrasure between that molar and that premolar. Yeah. And that's why I think cuspids and premolars are more indicative of a class one, class two, class three when your screening case is chair side. Mm-hmm. Those are more reliable reference points compared to just looking at molar occlusion if you're classifying something as quote class one. Does that make sense? So can I ask kind of maybe it might be a little bit of a dumb question, but Okay, so you go through this thing, class one, you find out later on it's class two. Right. How does that change your treatment planning? So it really depends on what your end goals are because the way that I do it is I break up my orthodontic parameters between cosmetic driven and comprehensive driven. Mm-hmm. Cosmetic driven is basically straight front teeth, nice smile, that's about it. Yeah. We're not looking for perfect posterior occlusion or coupling or any of that. And so each one of those is going to have different codes and different fees attached to them. And I do global fees. So that includes records, that includes orthodontic treatment, that includes retainers at the end, all of that stuff. I'm a big believer in global fees. I like that idea. Today was the first day I heard about that. Yeah. And I think uh, Dr. Patel was talking about global yes, fees for Yes, Mona implant, Patel right? was talking about it with implants. And I thought that was a perfect segue because I do perfect, the exact yeah. same thing with orthodontics. Yeah. So can you explain it's that to us who don't know? Oh, so so I mean, yeah, no, that, 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 down for that's why you weren't in there on the, in the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect no, question. Oopsies. That's a perfect question. Do you want to take it, Andrew? Or? I mean, I can try. I'll okay. do my best. You fix me. All right. So the idea is presenting the patient one fee that is inclusive of every little um, bracket item below it. So Bingo. rather than just yeah. saying, okay, so for your records, it's going to cost, you know, t- $25, mm-hmm. and then for your pano, it's going to be this and this. and this. That's yeah. probably a little bit yeah. overwhelming for a patient yes. to be like, then they're going to line item and be like, well, actually, doctor, I want you to skip this step right here because I don't want to pay that fee. Bingo. You know what I mean? Like, it's just easier yeah. for treatment. And, and, and that, at the end of the day, it's getting away from light item a la carte stuff yeah. and just be like, for your five-course meal, it is X amount of dollars. Like, that is it. And simplifying it. 
for the team, simplifying it for the patient. Yeah. As a patient, I would say I would appreciate that more so that I know what to expect. Like yes. my issue with going mm -hmm. to some places um, that are, yeah, like a la carte, it's like, oh, I don't know what added fee they're going to add to this. Yes. They're telling yes. me my appointment is just like Bingo. this much, Bingo. but really it's mm -hmm. a whole lot more. And I got a question from a student earlier today about that was that, you know, with the a la carte fee, um, say, for example, and I'm going to give my fees because I'm transparent. I really don't care. My cosmetic fee, um, my cutoff for that, like for aligners, for example, is 20 aligners or less. My fee for that is $4,000. I should say 20 aligners per arch. So it mm -hmm. can be up to 20 aligners up top, up to 20 aligners on the bottom if I'm doing Invisalign or in-house or whatever. Yeah. So my global fee is $4,000. Mm-hmm. And that includes the records, that includes the aligners, that includes the retainers at the end, all of that stuff, right? For most comprehensive cases, it's $5,800, okay? And so by simplifying it like that, it's easier for me, it's easier for my patients, mm -hmm. and it's easier for my team. Because if my team has all this stuff like, oh, do I need to add a CBCT to this? Do I need to add extra retainers to this right. is there a, like a fibrotomy fee if we need to like or an enamel plasty fee to like reshape enamel after if you if you muddy the waters that much it's not going to be it's it's not going to be simple enough to be applicable like yeah. you know if you confuse people both patients and your team too much it's not going to become a solid part of your practice. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I guess my question though is, if you are, are you sub not submitting to insurance, or are you also submitting to insurance, and what portion of that gets submitted for their thousand dollars or whatever that they have for coverage? So that's an excellent question. So my global fee is built into the main code. So like a, yeah, okay. like a macro code, and then right. So okay. like. For ortho, for example, they have interoceptive treatment of adolescent dentition. They have comprehensive treatment of yeah. adolescent dentition, interoceptive of adult, adolescent of adult, blah, 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 blah. My global fee is built into that, and it's not necessarily inclusive of retainers and sure. stuff like that. Because I'm just going to focus on my global fee of the main procedure. Mm -hmm. And then, like I was saying earlier, a student of mine is just like, so if a aligner case is 14 aligners per arch versus 20 aligners per arch, you're not messing with the fee between those. Right. And I'm like, correct. Because there are some cases that I will take less time and have more profit on. There will be some cases that I take more time and less profit on. But at the end of the day, it averages it's out. It's, out. it's yeah. a wash. And, and, and also, can it's I, applicable. I, I like I, the thing I like about this is like you're not punishing people for having more jacked up teeth right. or giving them a, a why do they deserve to pay less because their teeth are less jacked up? Like it, it's not. I just don't think that's fair to. But do I think that, then but. it also gives you the opportunity to give equal care to everybody. There right. is no like this patient paid less mm -hmm. so that I'm going to give them less time in the chair. You're right. going to give that patient the time that they need right. with you. Doesn't matter because everybody's paid the same thing. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I mean, we could look at things from a zero sum kind of profit and loss statement, or we can look at how do we treat people well mm -hmm. and treat yes. them efficiently and effectively and compassionately. But at the same time, we still have to make it make sense business-wise and overhead and all that stuff. Sure. So that's the way that I myself have settled on. I don't know if that's the right answer, but, like, it seems to be doing pretty well. <laughs> so, like, and people really resonate with it. So. Yeah. And I think with patients, they talk to other people in the community and they'll right. ask them, like, hey, how much was your ortho? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then the patient then kind of already know, like if you're referring somebody, they're going to yeah. get the same thing. There's no like, oh, why did that person get to pay less? It's mm -hmm. like, yeah. Or like, mm -hmm. why am I paying $20 more? Like, yeah, like, yeah exactly. Really yeah. Things What's the different? And they yeah. might not Focus understand on, yeah. the nuances of dentistry, why a case might be more complicated than the other. There That's might be something point. they can't see, yep. right? Yep.
Exactly. So, Doctor, earlier you mentioned, um, do you feel like all offices should be providing ortho? Maybe this is my personal bias because I quote unquote sell continuing education to <laughs> Sure, sure. Yeah, that's the answer. Like, yeah, in every the GP should this be a sure, ortho sure. and you should yeah. take my course. Sure. You know, but from a practicality standpoint, I do. Okay, so the ADA itself has estimated that 75% of the adult population suffers from some sort of malocclusion. Yeah. So, like, I'm sorry, but if we truly treated all 70% of the adult population, there's not enough orthodontists to go around to treat that. Right. Okay. And so there's from that standpoint, but also I... I also believe, as far as specialists goes, that, and I love specialists, don't get me wrong, but, like, specialists exist to do special things. With the advancements in clear liner therapy and short-term orthos, straight wire systems, treating a class one malocclusion is no longer a special thing, in my opinion. I see what you're saying, yeah. It should be in the toolbox of any well-versed general practice. Sure. Sure, that makes sense. And from hygienist standpoint, are lower incisors that are straight are they easier to clean than severely crowded? One hundred percent. Obviously, I mean, and yeah. you're gonna see lower disease rates for perio. I mean, and less caries if they're straighter too. Yeah, but I think another point is that obviously we care about accessibility, right? We want access right. to care. Right. And patients are gonna go to where it's easier for them to get care. And yeah. we obviously don't want them getting, you know, I don't know, do-it-yourself ortho, mm-hmm. um, right? You yeah. want to make it... Do you want to name ex- drop a brand that you hate so much <laughs> no, on this no, podcast? I would, okay. I would never do that. Don't come after me. I don't have any <laughs> you know money. You they would, too. Um, they really would. Uh, but y'all know who I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, yeah. If your patient already comes to your practice and then you have these services you can offer them right. and you show them, like, how affordable and how accessible it is, mm-hmm. they're more likely to get, get that treatment under the supervision of a dentist, which they should be supervised Bingo. by a dentist. Bingo. And that's the thing. In my practice, over half of the orthodontics that I suggest, it's teed up and it's quote unquote sold, even though that's like a naughty term, right? Sure. Supposedly. Um, but it is packaged in the name of health. It's not so much aesthetic driven because yeah. the position of teeth for occlusion through cleansability, through all of this stuff, through periodontal support and, you know, all of that. That, to me, quote unquote, sells more cases than like, have you ever thought about straightening your teeth? Versus my hygienist, they bring up, it's like, you deposit a lot of calculus around these lower incisors. And how easy is it for you to clean around those? And they're like, yeah, not very, and all that stuff. It's like, well, is that a concern for you? Would you like to look at options as far as maybe as rounding things out and making things more cleansable mm-hmm. and all that stuff? And also, you know, as a byproduct, straightening these teeth. And they're like, yeah, I'm I'm interested. I didn't know you guys had any options for that. Yeah, I, yeah. I just, I thought I was too They're old. Always surprised. I thought I was too, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And that's how, that's actually how I prefer to open the conversation yeah. versus the whole like 80s questionnaire. Like, if you could rate your smile from <laughs> one to 10. Are you happy and blah, with blah, your blah, smile? Blah. Yeah, how happy are you with your smile? Yeah. And what would it take to fix your smile? It's always straighter and wider, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. That's always the answer. And those things matter, too. And also, like, come, coming from a like, public health standpoint, from a public health clinic, like, those things matter, too. I have patients who, they come in, they want whitening. Right. They want straight teeth, too. Right. right? Like, they, your smile, your appearance matters. That helps yes. with self-esteem. That helps with, like, mm-hmm. getting jobs and going out and doing the things that you need to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, next question. Ready right okay. for this? Do it. One thing that we hear quite a bit is, you know, a patient went through ortho, then they come back with TMJ issues. Ooh, nice. So explain to me, is that, first of all, true? Is there any truth to that? Okay. And then also, if it is true, how does that come about? Okay. So TMJ issues, me, myself, personally, I've never had a TMJ issue arise post-ortho. I'm sure it happens. Mm -hmm. Now, if it happens to me, and this is just my personal take on things, so don't take it out, you know, on your host here. (laughs) But, like, 
to me, if that happens, then something was missed on the front end um, diagnostically. Okay. Okay. So, like, I how I teach my 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 students is a, a very detailed screening process, and one of them is TMJ. I've never, me myself, I've never had one get worse. Okay. I've had people stay the same. I've had people get a lot better. Okay. But I've never had one get worse. Like they don't all of a sudden develop popping and clicking right. and all that kind of stuff. Right. I've had plenty of folks that had pre-existing popping and clicking that it still happened. But I never, but in those cases, I never, like, promised that it would get better. Yeah. I said, hey, this is already happening. It's probably still going to happen but your teeth are going to be straight and you're going to have right. a better bite. Yeah. And then there have been plenty of times where they had tension headaches and all of that stuff. And in three months worth of treatment, those went away. Nice. And five years later have still been fine. Yeah. So they sing my praises. But I've never had an issue where they, they were completely, completely asymptomatic and never had any clicking or popping or whatever, and then all of a sudden started developing clicking or popping. Have you I had have that? Not had, have you had patients had that happen. mentioned that to you, or is this the first time you're hearing of that particular concern? I feel like I kind of have, but we don't do a lot of ortho in like. Well, I mean, it's not yeah. even like my ortho patients. Yeah, but it's, it's like just the, people the 28 year old that comes in. She's like, you know, happened ever since I, you know, went through ortho, and I'm like. I don't know that's related, okay, so but it's I so. I work in like public health, right? And so a lot of my patients, we don't offer ortho and they right. can't afford it. So right. they just go without. So the majority of patients I, I, but, that I'm seeing but, is the but, first but, time they've been to the dentist. So, so, so here's different. the thing, and this is a little bit anecdotal on my part, but like, because I, I, st- I started off in dentistry and public health. I, I worked public health for three years before mm. starting my own practice, right? So. If you don't know and if you're not screening and if you're not really like screening and diagnosing the patient on the front end for these things, they could have pre-existing conditions, but they don't really know and you don't know unless if you're specifically looking for yeah. them. Does that, that make sense? That's yeah. true. I think, yeah, for and sure. That's, and that's me just kind of haphazardly waxing philosophical about this but that like intuitively that's what it makes me think yeah is going on unless if you're doing trying to do crazy ortho mechanics where you're literally like trying to bring their lower jaw forward through crazy class two elastics and whatever yeah but unless if you're really doing some pretty wild stuff the likelihood of creating tmj from out of thin air is pretty minimal yeah that makes sense good i like that answer thank you (laughs) um you mentioned a lot about airway issues Mm. and you talked a little bit about like you know signs and symptoms things that you're looking for you you mentioned a couple times even you're like okay then they're gonna have a vaulted palate and this like what what's the the typical facial structure of someone who's gonna have airway issues yeah so one of the first things i look for i i talked about in my presentation about kind of systemizing the way that we look things so i look at front right left up or lower you know mm-hmm. i yeah. talked about that quite a bit and so front one of the first things i look at is when they smile and like just kind of just grimace like i squinted argh, biggest you know grin that they can give um how narrow is their smile and how much buckle tissue are they showing right so, well, like, when I smile, it's pretty narrow. And so that's one of the first things that I look at because um, I actually have a YouTube video. Um, I forget the name of it. It's called, like, the cheapest airway screener in the world or something like that. Yeah. But basically, there was some studies done by Jim McNamara out of the University of Michigan, I believe it was, that anthropologically we look at things of like how developed an arch should be. And so inner molar distance. So if you measure the, the distance between number three and number 14 from the lingual surfaces of each, they should be 
in adults 36 millimeters or more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you know what you have clinically in your everyday practice in, in every patient that sits in your chair? Do you know what we have that's literally 36 millimeters in width? No. I don't. A cotton roll. Oh. Really? A standard. We're going to go cotton stick cotton rolls roll. in our mouth after this. Oh my this. gosh. A standard <laughs> cotton roll is literally 36 millimeters in length. So if you want to screen a patient on if they're constricted or not, literally take with cotton forceps a cotton roll mm -hmm. and see if it fits passively in her molar and their palate. Interesting. And if it's bunching up, they're constricted. Boom, roasted. Okay. And so my entire family and myself. <laughs> <on this. laughs> I'm 32 millimeters myself. So I get it. Like, yeah. I totally do. So what are you going to do? What can you do about that? Now, you can't, from what I understand, you can't widen your palate. At to that a point. point, you can. You can lateral development because I talked about in my, in my course or my class this uh, morning, I talked about lateral development versus true expansion. Right. Right. So if you have molars and all that stuff that are literally just rolled in, you can develop those arches and you can get development that way. Versus, so like say, exa for example, and for the audience at home, you can't quite see my hand gestures here, but say I have molars that are leaning in this way mm -hmm. and those are 32 millimeters. I could expand those and possibly laterally develop those, upright those and get to that 36 and be okay because they are in an upright position now okay. versus rolled in. Right. Compared to if they're already upright, but they're 32 millimeters, getting this is going to be a lot harder. Getting that true upright. Impossible or just harder? Harder. So what, what do they do for something like that? I mean, so for adults, you know, for adults, my favorite thing is MSE, mini screw assisted expansion. Where it's like a, Sounds st terrible. a I know standard it does. expansion. It's actually, it's really it's, not bad. It's not, sure, sure. It just screws <laughs> yeah. in your mouth. Not yeah. that bad. <laughs> it says the, <laughs> says <laughs> the 33 <laughs> millimeter arch over here or yeah. whatever he said. <laughs> but like, uh, but yeah, there's Sarpy, there's Marpy, there's MSE. There's all this type of adjunct expansion type stuff mm -hmm. that's available for those people that are truly constricted. They're already upright. They can't benefit from just tipping the teeth right. and making them upright. They're already upright, but they're still constricted. Yeah. That is where more adjunct expansion therapies are going to be warranted. Right. Okay. Makes sense. You yeah. good on that one? Okay. I'm just here for commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions? All right. So I think there's, there's probably too many questions, but <laughs> I want to talk probably – two more topics okay i want to talk about gaining space yeah so i think this is something i don't think hygienists ever talk about we uh -huh. never learn about if there's crowding what do you do to get the space mm -hmm. to make the room without mm -hmm. extracting a tooth mm -hmm. yeah and and that's one of the that's one of the most fundamental things that I try to teach on because, you know, I kind of jokingly say, but there's a lot of truth to it in my presentation, is that I'm, I'm nobody special on this. I'm not some super, super genius about this stuff. It's just I tried to simplify things out of necessity because I myself needed simple to make it applicable. Mm -hmm. Then my team also needed simple. My patients right. needed simple, that type of stuff. So when I look at things, I look at five ways to develop an arch and gain space. And three of those are through tooth position and Two of those, two of the five, are dealing with actual tooth morphology themselves. Mm -hmm. And so when I teach my students, I talk about proclination, a.k.a. bringing front teeth forward. Number two is lateral development. Some people call it expansion, but when we're dealing with adult ortho, mm -hmm. expansion is kind of a misnomer because unless if you're doing crazy surgical expansion or mini screw assisted expansion 
expansion to me is literally widening the palate and widening that suture. Right. Other than that, to me, it's literally just lateral development. Yeah. That's how I describe it. So we talk about proclination, moving front teeth forward. We talk about lateral development, moving side teeth, canines, premolars, molars, laterally developing those and increasing more width that way. And then the third way to develop arch length is distalization. If your molars, if these back teeth are too far mesial, too far forward, you literally push them backwards. You distalize Interesting. them. That is a harder mechanic. Yeah. And that, that takes a lot more nuance and a lot more training to do. But it's, for someone like me who does a lot of ortho, I do that all day, every day. Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily a good place to start off with. Sure. But those are three ways through truth position that we can gain space to unravel teeth. Mm -hmm. The other two out of the five are dealing with tooth morphology, the literal shape and size of the teeth. And one of those is going to be well-versed with most people, and that's IPR, an approximal reduction. So we're literally skinning up the teeth. We are literally reducing the mesial distal width of those teeth. Mm -hmm. And we're reducing friction points and all that stuff so the teeth can derotate and unravel a little bit easier. But most of the time, we're literally reducing the mesial distal width of the teeth. It's like, you know, if you have X amount of people, so say you have five people in an elevator and each one of those people are 400 pounds versus if you skinny up those people and they're now so 200 pounds is this where the many, keto comes in what's that <laughs> is that is this where the keto part comes in <laughs> how many more people can we fit in that elevator right, or how much right. more comfortable they can be you know and not be shoulder to shoulder you know, it's literally taking up less mass and less volume so that way we can create space. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth way is literally taking out teeth, extraction orthodontics. That's why I stay away from, but that is literally the fifth way of gaining space. Now, depending on where a person is at in their orthodontic journey, I'm going to recommend that we focus on three of those five. I'm going to be focusing on proclination. If you know, if you can procline teeth, and that's what I talked about today, was really screening these patients to understand what to look out for on the front end. But basically the three mechanics starting out is proclination, lateral development, and IPR. Mm -hmm. Distalization and extraction are still on the table, but it that takes a lot more training yeah. to do, yeah. and that's not really good for the novice or intermediate. Does that I, make I feel sense? like it used to be really popular, though, right? Like, it was just like, okay, we're going to take out, you know, your premolars, and yeah. we're going to call it good. That's, that's, that's still standard the standard for, of care for, at least in my area, for most right? orthodontists. Now, is that because that's their training was for forever ago? Right. Well, there's you know, are that. They, and are they newer? Th we're, okay, and this is probably going to get me in trouble, but I really don't it's care. It's a hygiene podcast. Doctors aren't listening to this. You're okay. fine. So <laughs> to me, because I'm so versed in the sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing and all that stuff, I'm pretty against extraction orthodontics. I've done extraction orthodontics, but it's literally less than 5% of my cases. Yeah. 95% of the time I'm doing non-extraction orthodontics. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's my personal bias, and that's the parameter of which I present mm -hmm. this information from, mm -hmm. right? So it's interesting. I obviously listen to TikTok doctors, you know, because that's where you get that's, the best mm, that's information. That's truth right there, right? So there's yeah. this uh, TikTok doctor, large following. It's actually a Spanish-speaking TikTok doctor, which is obviously why I would follow. But anyways, he um, said... <laughs> That he's against not extracting teeth uh -huh. because then you end up looking like a horse. Oh, um, yeah. Um, so he's against he's against non-extraction because you're going to be too full. Yeah. 
Right, and I hear that from the uh, extraction camps. It's like, oh, well, if you don't extract in this case, they're going to look like a monkey. Like, they're just going to be too full. They're going to look like a baboon. That's what I always hear. And it's like, well, that goes back to the diagnosis that I was talking about earlier. Say, for example, if we truly learn what a class two is, right? Right, right. So if you take a class two that their mesial buccal cusp is in that lower central groove because that tooth is rotated distally mm -hmm. and you derotate that and all of a sudden they're a half step class two and you treat that non-extraction they can look pretty dang full they can look pretty toothy unless if you do anterior posterior correction mm -hmm. any time that a quote unquote non-extraction orthodontics looks too toothy is because they tried to do it without doing true anterior-posterior correction. Any time that you take the time to literally move those back teeth where they need to be, it never looks toothy. It has yet to happen in 10 years of my practice. Yeah. See, that's why I appreciate these conversations, right? Because, like, we hear all these things on, like, social media. And to have a true conversation and talking about these questions, these, right. these yeah. things that come up that our patients are hearing, right? right. And that we should exactly. have an answer for because they're going to come to us with these questions. Right. All right, last one. Here we go. This is the kicker. You know, I think when I was in school, it was uh, clear line of therapy is good for, you know, I guess very, very cosmetic, mm -hmm. very little rotation, very little anything. Um Let's fix it. But then in the case that I saw earlier today by, uh, was it Dr. Fryer? Oh, Kevin Fryer. Yeah. Yeah. So that case was, uh -huh. and, and for the listeners at home, one of the, the worst malocclusion cases I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, crowding. Crossbites. Um, crossbites everywhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh -huh. it was, the end result was fantastic without all of the, we're always told there's going to be so much recession. There's going to be so much all yeah. this stuff that happens. Yeah. So I guess my question is like, so we are at that point now that we can do that? Or is that just a unicorn case? That is a case that is very predictable as long as you know what the F you're doing. Yeah. That is, and that, that to me is what's different. And, and that, that's the thing why I show that case is because I don't want to just show cases of mine and be on a pedestal of be like, oh, look how great I am and look how yeah. much, what we've done. Like, I want to show cases of other people too. be like, I'm not a unicorn. I'm not special. As long as you know what you're doing, these are the type of results that are achievable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that thing, he understood what he could achieve with proclination. He understood what he could do with lateral development. He understood where his incisor angles were, where he was protrusive versus where he was inclined, where he could use proclination, all that stuff. He understood that and applied that using a system like Invisalign, which is clear aligners, which you look at that case and that's not like a simple case right right it was crazy he achieved yeah. that with invisalign i achieve ridiculous stuff with invisalign and malocclusions that you would you always hear oh they need comprehensive braces like mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. honestly i can achieve a great result with any malocclusion using invisalign because i know how teeth work and i know the mechanics that need to happen as long as their compliance is going to be there. Oh, for sure. That's the biggest differential for me with Invisalign is what is this patient's compliance going to be? I showed on my Facebook, um, I don't know if you guys saw, on my Facebook I showed this crazy high canine case where um, high canine, half step, midline was completely off, blah, 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 blah. And the final results are awesome. Midline is on point. Canine is down. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I did that straight wire because I'm dealing with a 13-year-old little. Yeah. 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 And that um, is not going to wear their aligners. Yeah. So I did it straight wire because I knew compliance wasn't going to be there. Force them into compliance. Yeah. Right. 
<laughs> and so it's not <laughs> through metal. <laughs> it's not a matter of if aligners will work. Aligners, I can do a lot of stuff with aligners as long as you know the mechanics, mm-hmm. but then also you take in the patient cooperation like the demeanor and all and that stuff, stuff which demeanor. I did have written yep. down. We we skipped over that one particularly with attitude and demeanor. And um, Doctor, we're going to have to have you come back on again yep. uh, because we're running out of time. And gosh, this has been a lot of a lot of information. If anyone wanted to, so hygienists, if you want your doctors to be doing more ortho, um, where can they send their doctors or where can they take courses themselves from you? Yeah, so um, I'm pretty easy to find on the interwebs. Um, Matthew Standridge on Facebook, um, Dr. Matthew Standridge on Instagram. I have a Facebook teaching page, uh, Matthew Standridge DDS FAGD. Anyone who wants to reach out to me directly, my email is Dr. Matt, D R M A T T, at Yates Center Dental.com. That's my practice name, you know, plus my Dr. Matt at. Um, but yeah, I, I am happy to help anybody out. This is like, like I said, outside of just transforming smiles and stuff in my practice this is my second favorite way of like yeah. kind of giving back yeah. so yeah. i'm happy to do it so everyone we have we'll have that in the show notes make sure you check it out send your doctors send team members or or whoever thank you doctor for being on i appreciate you thank you appreciate you guys